When I was about 19 years old, I got hired in the fashion department of a local Supercenter store. It's a bit like Walmart, but it's exclusive to the Midwest. At the time, I had the sides and back of my hair shaved, and the top of my hair was bleached blonde and twisted into a high bun. I promise this is relevant to the story. I had just finished my computer training two days earlier, and was on the floor alone stocking some baby clothes. About a box or two into my stocking, an announcement came over the speakers that informed customers our credit card readers were down, but we were still able to take cash at this time. I heard a couple of groans around me, but it seemed like most everyone was content to just go on shopping until it was announced that the card readers were back up. I crouched down to grab some more clothes out of a box to shelve them when a guy walked up to me, holding a few items in his hands. Hey miss, I just have a few items I wanted to buy real quick. Do you know how long the card readers are going to be down? Me, still crouched on the floor. You know, I'm not sure, I don't think this happens very often, but they said they could still take cash for now. I only have a card on me. Damn, that sucks. I'm sorry about that. Is there anything I can help you find while you wait to check out? Nah, I guess I'll just hang around. I can stick over here and just bother you. I don't really respond to his comment and just nodded and got back to folding. The man asks me a few more random questions before he starts getting pretty creepy. The guy starts walking a bit closer to me. He's at least a foot taller than I am. So, why do you have your hair like that? all bleached on top. Oh, I just like the way it looks. No, that's not it. You're doing it for attention. Nope, I honestly just like how it looks. Plus, the shaved parts keep me cooler in the summer. What, your family doesn't give you enough attention? You don't get enough attention from boys? I don't know. I, I just like my hair like this. All right, well, since you want attention so bad... How about I wait until you get off work and show you the kind of attention I think you deserve? At this point in the conversation, he's practically hovering over me. I think I looked really intimidated because a woman immediately ran over to the two of us when she heard him say that. She quickly pulled me away, telling me that she needed help getting an item down from a high up shelf. I'm not sure if the woman was genuinely trying to save me or really did just need help reaching something. I spoke to my manager about the event later in the day, and she informed me that there is nothing she can do for customers like that, and that I'll just have to deal with it. When I got off that night, I practically ran to my car, praying that the guy wasn't waiting for me. I didn't stick around long enough to see if he was. I quit pretty soon after this, because I was so shaken. I have no idea what he would have had planned for me, but I'm so thankful for that woman. So guy who thinks I deserve your creepy attention, let's not meet. Several years ago, I was working in a shopping mall as a marketing manager. My job was very much in the public eye in my community. My main job was to get people into the shopping center, mostly by hosting events such as fashion shows music events and beauty pageants, mostly that I presented myself, so I was well known around town. I had a good group of friends I had known since high school, and we saw each other regularly. When I was around 29, I had been married for four years and just had my son. My friend Chrissy, not her real name, had just ended her second marriage. It was a running joke in the group that she really liked wedding cake. She had just hooked up with a new man and wanted us to get together that weekend so she could introduce him. In typical Chrissy fashion, there was around a month in time moving from husband number two to moving in with new man Jake, not his real name. The meeting went off without an issue we all attended, muttering between ourselves that it would never last. He was a lot older than she was himself recently divorced with a very interfering ex. He was also no oil painting, around three weeks after Chrissy announced she was pregnant. 
One day I walked into my office at the shopping mall to find a large bunch of roses and a teddy on my desk. I received flowers regularly from suppliers, etc., so it was not a surprise. But the teddy was new. I am not, or never have been, a teddy kind of girl. The small card just said, I can't wait to see you again. I asked the secretary if she knew where they came from, and she said she had no clue. They were delivered to the security office before any of us arrived. Then the phone call started. Direct to my office phone skipping the reception. Only a few people know this number. At first they were silent calls, with just heavy breathing on the line. After a few days of silence he started to talk. Things like, I am watching you. I like your skirt. You are beautiful. I wish you were my girlfriend, etc. Each time I slam the phone down. The voice was gravelly and sounded as if the person was trying to make his voice deeper than it was. After daily calls for a week, I went to my boss who had the number changed. The call stopped after this. Around a month after this, we hosted a get-together at my house and Chrissy and Jake attended. As he walked through the door and greeted me, I froze. As soon as he spoke, I knew it was him. Chrissy was by now very pregnant, and I did not want to upset her, so I never told her. I confronted him about it, and he apologized, and said he did not mean to creep me out. They left early that day, and they moved to another town a few months after. The marriage did happen, and I was invited. I declined. The marriage lasted a year. Chrissy is now engaged again. She has been three times since her and Jake divorced. I did tell her about it a few years later. She said she understood me not telling her at the time. She would have not believed me anyway. He must have got my number from her address book. He had apparently done this to another woman at their church after they moved in. Let's not meet again. This is a story from my childhood, one of the ones that haunt me to this day. Have you ever seen those memes where it says people react like a criminal when an unexpected visitor arrives on their doorstep? They freeze and drop everything they're doing and throw themselves to the floor to avoid being seen in a window? This is my story of how I became one of those people. At the time, I must have been around seven and a half. I was visiting the Midwest, Kansas to be exact, from South Korea, where I was born and raised just visiting family, nothing major. On that particular night, the adults, our aunt and uncle, our parents, were going to have a date night, so our parents had ordered us pizza before they left and waited for it to arrive, for we wouldn't have to open the door for anyone. My aunt uncle had two kids. Two boys, to be exact, and they were ages 15 and 8. Like I said before, I was maybe 7 and a half at the time. My older sister was 11. And our baby brother was the young, tender age of 3. So all in all, we're ready to just have a night of fun games after all. It wasn't often the cousins got together like this. They lived in the States, and we lived in Korea. But we love each other dearly. We saw our parents out of the garage entryway. They made sure we knew the rules, and we could recite them back to them. They also made sure we knew where the telephones were, and the emergency numbers to accompany them. It's just going to be a typical night of no parents. Or so we thought. It had maybe been an hour, maybe two, after our parents had left. We were downstairs in the basement in the playroom, or the game room, whatever people like to call it these days. We were down there just watching movies, playing air hockey, things of that nature, just being kids. We weren't being loud or anything like that, and even if we were, it wouldn't be too big of a deal. Because the way houses were in Kansas, the basements are built into the ground in case of a tornado. I had gone upstairs with my oldest cousin because I wanted a drink of chocolate milk, and I couldn't reach the cups alone. So we wandered upstairs into the kitchen, which was on the far end of the house. The others stayed downstairs, continuing their games. 
We had maybe been upstairs for 15 to 20 minutes, because while I was drinking my milk, my older cousin was making snacks since we were planning to watch a movie. Then all of a sudden, we hear the doorbell ring. I remember my cousin looked at me and told me to stay here, because it was odd that the doorbell was ringing. It wasn't late, but it certainly wasn't early. And I say this because it was summer. It was around 8 o'clock. My cousin started to creep towards the door quietly. It was unnerving for someone to be ringing the doorbell. We weren't expecting any guests, and the pizza had been delivered before our parents had even left for the evening. And before he's even halfway to the door, whoever's on the other side starts rapidly ringing the doorbell over and over, the constant ringing echoing throughout the house. And by this point, I had looked over toward the staircase, and I saw our other siblings starting to creep up the stairs with the exclusion of the baby who was still asleep in the crib down in the guest room. The oldest of the kids let's just go ahead and call him James from here on out, put his finger to his lips and told us to be quiet to make it seem like no one was home, despite there being lights on. He crept closer to the door as the banging and ringing on the doorbell continues and he peeked through the peephole. I had never seen my cousin look so freaked out, his face drained of color, and he backed away from the door rapidly, and he told us all to go downstairs. But of course, we didn't listen. Honestly, we thought he was playing a joke. Maybe it was some of his friends wanting to scare us, since he did cancel his plans that night to stay home and watch all of us kids. My older sister shoved past him and looked through the peephole herself, and for whatever reason... Whatever was on the other side of the door made her have the same exact reaction, and she stumbled back from the door just as pale. At the time, I didn't understand what was going on. I don't think any of us younger kids really did. But something wasn't right. After a while, 20 minutes, whoever was at the door stopped ringing the doorbell and all was quiet again. It seemed like they gave up. Maybe they thought no one was home. If only we knew how wrong we really were. We all sat in silence for a while after this initially occurred. My other cousin, who I'm just going to call Kyle for the purpose of the story, mustered up the courage to ask his brother James, who was at the door, and why James and my sister were acting so skittish. James told us that there was a man wearing dark clothes and seemed to be carrying some type of a package or large box, but he couldn't see his face. Of course, Kyle being the little smarty pants he was at the time, started to mock James, saying he was just being a scary cat and didn't recognize their neighbors. Kyle was convinced it was just a neighbor trying to drop off a package that might have got mixed up in the mail, seeing as it happened all the time. So we all agree that was the probable cause until we realized whoever was ringing the doorbell didn't just leave the package on the porch, which isn't that what most neighbors do? In the case no one answers, they'll just leave it. And why would they try to bring it over to the house at night instead of just waiting until the next day? But we thought it was over and done with. So we pushed it to the back of our minds. We didn't think it was important to call our parents and let them know what happened. It was over, after all. We went back to the kitchen, grabbed the snacks, and started to head back downstairs, until we heard banging again. But it wasn't from the porch this time. We were in shock. We froze in fear. I mean, it was coming from right behind us. We turned slowly, and looked back in the direction from which it came. We were currently standing in the dining room. We had already passed through the kitchen. It was like someone was banging on the kitchen window. You know the one that's typically above the sink. So your mother or your father can watch the kids while they play in the backyard while they wash dishes. So James and my older sister, who we are just going to call Nicole at this point, got down on their hands and knees and they crawled back into the kitchen much against our charging. 
Just as quickly as they crawled into the kitchen to take a peek, they crawled back to us in an almost hyper speed, and they told us to get low and stay low as we crawled into the den further down the hallway. James had us all huddle close to the fireplace, out of sight from the windows, and he told us to stay there. He was taking charge. He was protecting his home and family the best he knew how. James quickly crawled away. I didn't know where he was going, but I was scared. The banging was getting louder and it was getting closer and closer. At some point, I started to cry, and I remember Kyle put his hand over my mouth and my sister was hugging us tight. And around that time, we saw James starting to appear back around the corner, and he had his baseball bat. He had crawled up another staircase to get to his room. He crawled past us and put a finger to his lips again, and that's when we realized he was crawling towards the doggy door. He was attempting to close off the one entrance to the house that wasn't locked. Thankfully, he managed to get it latched in time, because we didn't think the man outside had realized the house had a doggy door. But when he heard the lock click into place, the banging became more erratic, more violent. Then all of a sudden, much like before, the banging stopped. But we heard pacing. Someone was walking back and forth across the porch, slowly, deliberately. Thump, 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 thump. His heavy boots thundered across the red oak porch. And then without warning, the pacing stopped. And it became quiet, eerily quiet. Then the man called out, Won't you open the door? I have a package for you. We didn't respond. We stayed quiet, or as quiet as we could be, with the way our hearts were pounding, and with how ragged our breathing was. The stranger called out again, Open the door! And again we didn't answer. The man called out angrily, I said open the door, I have a package! Like before, we didn't answer. Nor did we make any sudden movements. The man started banging again, this time, directly on the panel window of the room we were sitting in, yelling, I know you're in there. I know you can hear me. Open the door, or I'll open it for you. Bang, bang, bang. The window rattled and shook violently with each impact from the strange man. Thankfully, our cousin's house had reinforced windows, so they weren't easy to break. But unluckily, we didn't have any neighbors close by, so we didn't think anyone could hear the commotion. But while he was making all this noise, we took the opportunity to book it into another room and get to a phone. At one point while we were on the phone with the police officers, they asked us if we could describe the man, and all we knew is that he was tall and wearing black. So Kyle and I decided to be brave, so if something did happen to us that night, they would at least have a better description of who did it. We crawled back into the den and we dared to look out of a small corner of the window. We gently moved the curtains out of the way, and lord behold, the man was still banging. He had moved the shutters off the outside of the window. They're basically hanging off their hinges at this point, rattling with the wind. We made eye contact with the deranged man, direct soul-searching eye contact. I don't think before this night I had ever believed but there's pure evil in the world. But when I looked into that man's eyes, I didn't see a soul. I know it sounds crazy, but those were not the eyes of a human. He was something unlike anything I've ever seen before. Animalistic may be the only word I could describe it as, besides demonic. It was evil, unnatural, and something I never want to see again. When he saw us, he smiled a twisted grin that I'm sure he thought was reassuring, and he crouched down, for he could get a better look at us, I assume. And then he said, Don't you want your mail? You have mail. I can give it to you if you only open the door. I remember just grabbing onto Kyle's hand for dear life, and Kyle shook his head no, and he threw the curtain back over the window. And before we even had a chance to move any further... 
the man started violently banging on the window again. At this point, James had enough. He passed the phone to my sister and he yelled, Leave us alone. The police are on their way. You're not getting in here. After that, it seemed like the man panicked. The banging abruptly stopped. And then we heard rapid footsteps on the porch. And Kyle and I peeked out the window again. And the man was running through the yard. Past all the trees and he jumped the fence. The wooden 22-foot fence at the end of the yard into the alley that separated the neighborhood from the old cemetery. We stayed on the phone with the police until they arrived, and our parents arrived not long after. But the man was never caught, and we don't know what happened after that night. He just disappeared into thin air. To this day, I'm now 21, Whenever the doorbell rings, when I'm not expecting a visitor, my heart drops, and I break out in a cold sweat. Mystery package, man. Let's not meet again. I met Lucy for the first time when she fell asleep on my arm on the bus. When she woke up, she gave me a really weird look before shambling off the bus. I figured she was weirded out that I didn't wake her sooner, so I kicked myself for being a creep and went on with my day. Can't win them all. I was thrown for a hell of a loop when her whole friend group was sitting by my usual spot on the bus the next day. Being an awkward teen, I wasn't about to turn down any kind of positive attention. I got to know her friends and ended up on good terms with her before I realized I hadn't asked her name. I'm hard of hearing, so I didn't hear her when she said her name. Lucy, right? Yeah. Lucy and I had your typical high school courting process. That is to say, she was overwhelmingly forward, and after a few weeks I got the hint. As we were getting close, Lucy would fixate on learning about past heartbreak and finding out about my personal life. I'm a serial sharer, so I didn't really mind talking about myself, but she would constantly butt in by saying how screwed up things were and that she'd kick my friend's ass for hurting me. I was weirded out. Even at 16, I knew that was cringy, and I was going through my emo phase. The thing that really bugged me, at the time, was that she'd asked so much about me, she would never say anything about herself. It made me feel crappy always venting and never helping her out. During this time, she missed a few days, and I let another girl sit by me since it was an overcrowded bus, and I didn't think it mattered. When Lucy came back and saw me with another girl, you'd think she was shot. She just about ran to the seat behind us and started going off. I can't remember what exactly Lucy said, but the other girl never talked to me again after that. Once her rival was gone, Lucy reclaimed her spot next to me and was all sunshine and rainbows. Nobody ever asked to sit in Lucy's spot after that. Lucy always had a crude sense of humor, but after a while, things started getting hurtful. She would take jabs at my insecurities, and any time I got upset about it, she would give me crap for not being able to take a joke. These jokes usually stopped just shy of outright insulting me. When Lucy ended up breaking me down, she was super affectionate. She would sleep on my chest while we rode home on the bus, and she'd even talk about herself from time to time. I don't remember the first time she hit me. It seems like something that would be burned into my memory. Some kind of cinematic moment in my life. Honestly, it all just bled together after a while. I know it started off small though, flicking me and playful slapping. By the end of it, she would elbow me in the ribs for telling a bad joke. I didn't register as anything abusive until she slammed me into a wall while we were walking through the hallway after class. I told a crap joke, and she shoved me hard into the wall. She laughed because of the sound I made before shoving me again. People were going through the halls with us, but they didn't do anything. Sometimes I wonder what they thought of me. I didn't dump her after the hallway incident, but I did start standing up for myself. We started getting into a lot of fights after that. Of course, they only ever ended in one of two ways. She was right, or it was an honest mistake. 
I tried to break things off a few times around that time, but every time I did, she had a new sob story I hadn't heard before that made her actions totally understandable. I let it get in my head, and that she was some kind of tragic soul, and that I could help her. I convinced myself there was something noble about taking the abuse, and nobody I knew trying to step in and stop me. I finally got the nerve to dump her after three major things happened within a three-week span. First, I found out she was taking pictures of me while I wasn't looking and posting them online. The weird thing was that I only found out because she showed me. I felt gross seeing a bunch of nearly identical pictures of me not facing the camera. The way she showed me was worse. She seemed excited, like I'd be happy she invaded my privacy. The second weird thing happened when I tried to wake her on the bus. After about a half hour on my chest not saying anything, I nudged her shoulder since we were at our stop, and she just got up, looked me in the eye, and told me she wasn't asleep. Combined with the pictures, this seemed really weird to me. She didn't try to be cute or romantic about it or anything, just, I pretend to sleep on you sometimes. Like, what the hell? The breaking point came, when she was showing off some award she got from school. There was something off about the award. It didn't have her name on it. Oh no, it had a name. It even had a picture of her smiling on it. The problem is it wasn't addressed to a Lucy. You can't imagine what I felt when I found out I didn't know my girlfriend's name. A few days later, we got into one of our usual fights, and I broke things off. Lucy was always the persistent type. She would sit a few rows behind me on the bus and stare at me while I went to my car after getting off the bus. Looking at her wouldn't make her stop. It felt like she wanted me to know she was watching me. One day when she got on the bus, she looked at me in the eyes for a solid 20 seconds while she walked past me to her new seat. I'm pretty sure she was expecting me to say something to her. The next year I graduated and got a retail job. End of the story, right? I thought so too. It was the start of Christmas season and I was working cashier that night. Lucy came into the store I was working at. Random chance. It had been a year and a half since we broke up at this point, so I wasn't happy to see her, but surely we could pretend it wasn't weird. She gave me the look the squirrel in Ice Age gives his nut. She grabbed something from the front and went right into my line. She didn't say a word to me, but she wouldn't break eye contact, and she was swaying like an excited toddler. It hurt to look at her. I rang her up silently and waited for her to leave. I looked at the other cashier for support, and he told me she was giving her weird vibes. I got this really bad gut feeling after she left. Lucy became a regular at our little shop. She would come in and creep out my co-workers. Lucy never really tried to hide what she was doing. One of the cashiers mentioned how often she came while ringing her out, and she said she was visiting me. She didn't say my name, but she described me. After that, whenever she showed up, someone would make a note of it on the radio. She was usually in one of the areas bordering my workspace. I heard about her a lot more than I saw her, so I think she was hiding from me. She never got banned from the store despite complaints, because the managers were penny-pinching a-holes who would sell any one of us to get sales up. I know Lucy was responsible for at least one resignation from my workplace. Someone who looked like me caught her staring a few times and heard how often she came. After a while, the stress just wasn't worth minimum wage. The last time I saw Lucy at the store was a little over a year ago now. I was hanging out with one of the girls in the back while we were loading up carts with stuff we had to stock. We were right by the back entrance so you could see right in from the store proper. I left to put up the stuff in my cart, and when I came back, I saw her. She was standing about 40 feet from the back entrance, still as a statue. I froze when I saw her. I watched her stare into the back for what felt like hours, 
before she suddenly turned and walked briskly away. The girl I was talking to was still in the back when I got back. She was a lot more awkward after that. The girl quit three days later and just about crushed my ribs when she hugged me goodbye. She hated her job, so I'd like to think that it didn't have anything to do with Lucy, but I don't know. I left the store not too long after that and got a job that didn't involve customer service. That wasn't the last time I saw her, though. Over the summer, after taking my new job, I had a mental breakdown. I convinced myself that I was unlovable and that Lucy was the only person I could possibly be with. I left the house without any conceivable plan to find her. With stars in the sky, lit by street lamps, I saw her. She was with another girl. I got so close I could almost touch her before I snapped to my senses. I thought about her stalking me at the store, and I realized I was becoming her. I ran home. I cried that night. The last time I saw Lucy was last week. I was walking home from work and decided to stop for dinner. I thought I saw her in line but convinced myself it was someone else. I ordered and sat down to eat. I was looking out the window while I ate and she took the table between me and the window I was looking out. She was with some guy that looked vaguely familiar. Maybe a school friend? She was sat at an angle, so she was half looking at him, and every few seconds, she would look right at me. I know it was her. She changed her hair. It looks an awful lot like mine now. After I finished, I went to the bathroom because I felt sick. After washing my hands, I looked into the mirror, and I felt like I could die. It hadn't occurred to me before, but I was wearing my work uniform, complete with company name on my hat in big letters. She was reading my hat. Lucy hasn't been to my current job yet, but I'm sure she'll turn up eventually. I'm moving soon, so I'm just hoping I'm not here anymore when Lucy turns up. Lucy has been a part of my life for the last four years. We dated for four months in high school, and she keeps turning up. I wasn't a paragon of mental health before I met her, but I feel like she broke me as a person, and I'll never forgive her for what she did to me. Since her abuse and her stalking, I've developed serious trust issues. I get painfully nervous leaving my house, and people who show interest in me immediately put me on edge. I've tried to date since everything happened, but I just can't. I'm too much work at this point so I've decided that I'll stay single until I can work through my issues. I'm begging you, Lucy. Please, let's never meet again. Firstly, English isn't my first language, so storytelling is quite a challenge. Please bear with me. My dad's job requires him to go inside people's houses. He has been in thousands of apartments and houses, so I asked him, what was the weirdest or creepiest thing he ever saw or experienced? My dad arrived early at this apartment complex around 7 a.m. because he had to go through every apartment, doing some maintenance starting from the basement. He entered a laundry room located in the basement where was a man around 50-ish, wearing a nice white shirt with a tie, suit pants, but no shoes and he had a green tarp in his hands. He thought it was kind of weird, but just ignored, since it was not his business. Later that day, he left to a local coffee shop to spend his break, and when he came back to work, there were police cars surrounding the area. Out of curiosity, he asked one of the officers what was going on, and turns out a homicide was committed. Dad then asked if what he saw was related to the crime, and oh, it was. After the police interrogation, they told him that a man without shoes stabbed his mother to death in his bathtub, wrapped her in a tarp, and dragged her outside. The police caught him dragging his dead mother in the backyard. Of course, they didn't let my dad do his job in the murderer's apartment until after a proper investigation. A while goes by, and dad gets to go there and finish what he is doing. 
A while goes by, and Dad gets to go there and finish what he was doing. He felt really uncomfortable doing plumbing and other maintenance in a house where someone got brutally murdered, especially in a bathroom. Bathtub full of dried up blood. Here's a little background information. I'm a foreign student studying in a small town in Germany. At the time this particular event happened, however, I was still living in Berlin. I lived in an older apartment with an older lady who rented the unit to me. The kitchen connected the two apartments that she owns, so we technically live in a separate unit, but we share the kitchen. The star of our story is, however, not the lady. She is nice. I still talk to her sometimes. The apartment building is five stories high with a staircase, no elevator. We live in the second story. The lady who rented the unit to me has always had a problem with the neighbors right downstairs because they were always very noisy. They fought a lot, and when they are on their balcony, it always smells heavily of smoke. The neighbors downstairs are an older couple, probably in their late 50s or early 60s. I didn't know much about them, except for their phone number and their names, which the landlady scribbled on a piece of paper for me in case they got too loud so that I could call them. Turns out I never needed the number to get to know them. One afternoon as I was cooking, the doorbell in landlady's apartment rang, but she was out. And not long after that it rang on my side, so I thought it must be her guest trying to reach out or something. So I looked at the peephole and there stood some older lady. So I thought it must be the landlady's friend. So I opened the door, and to my surprise, there stood the said lady without pants. As in she was wearing a shirt, but was in her underwear. Now at that point, I was only in Germany for a couple of months, so I wasn't really sure if that was normal. And my German was also not that good. This lady was mumbling something that I could barely make out. But since she rang the bell on the landlady's side first, I assumed she was looking for the landlady, and I tried telling her, with the best German that I could, that the lady was out, and will probably not be back until later. But this lady stood there mumbling something. I really could not understand her, so I just shook my head apologetically and smiled. So she began gesturing me to come with her, like she wanted to show me something. So I quickly turned off the stove and I followed her downstairs after grabbing my keys. She then started to ring a bell on the door right below us. Oh, so this is the neighbor? Then came another wave of shock, because after she repeatedly rang the bell, came a man to the door with no piece of clothing on except for his socks. I tried so hard not to make my weirded out face very apparent because I wasn't sure about German customs yet at that point, and I didn't want to be rude. And so this must be the husband. She gestured for me to come in. I was starting to wonder what her actual intention is calling me all the way down here. I thought it was something important for the landlady. But she just offered me something to drink, and I declined. But she insisted on getting me water anyway, and walked into the kitchen. Now I am still standing near the front door, with this man, who is now staring at me top to bottom. To be honest, he looks kind of drunk, and right at that moment I remembered how the landlady used to tell me that all they do is fight and get drunk. So I just smiled at him, and stood there awkwardly. But he decided to suddenly be friendly, because he kind of just grabbed my shoulder and dragged me inside of the house to show me different rooms and the balcony and their small garden and everything. I mean, the house itself is beautiful, such a contrast to the people living in it. It was uncomfortable to say the least, because he was very much naked and staying in a very close proximity to me. His arm was on my shoulders, and he was just looking at my face so closely I could feel his breath on my face. He then proceeded by asking if they had a beautiful garden. I just said yes and kind of laughed awkwardly. Thank God the wife came out from the kitchen at this point, and then she started shouting at him for doing what he was doing. She told him it is no way to treat a guest, and she handed me my glass of water, all the while still wearing no pants. 
I never drank the water, and quickly excused myself, saying that I needed to check my cooking upstairs. After some debate, I got out of the house, but the lady is still holding me at the door, pleading that I could stay a while and sit at the garden with her. I was ready to come up with more excuses before someone came through the door of the building and interrupted. It was the young man that lived two stories above us. Apparently, he just got back from grocery shopping, and he somehow dealt with them and told me to go back upstairs. So I went and waited upstairs to thank him. He was done talking to them after about two minutes, and he came upstairs to ask if I was alright, and told me not to get mixed up with those folks, because they are apparently known to be problematic. So yeah, he saved my day, and I thanked him for it. After that experience, I kind of just hurried my way up to the apartment every time I got back from somewhere, so that I didn't run into them. I actually met her once more after that. She looked sober, and was wearing pants this time. She didn't seem to recognize me, though. Thankfully, I have since moved away from there. My grandma was born in the 40s, when folks were nice, and nobody thought kidnappings were a common occurrence. She and her nine siblings often took the trains by themselves, going to and from the big city, where they lived in their grandparents' place. That was a four-hour train ride away. Usually, they did this on weekends to give their mom and dad a break. One day, Grandma was nine, about to be ten that weekend, and she was going to her grandparents' house a day before everyone else, by herself. That was common, and pretty ordinary. She got dropped off at the train station, got boarded on the right train by her dad, and off she went. Half of the way there, the train makes one of its stops and everyone is asked to evacuate because there is a malfunction with the rails. My grandma, Yara, is very scared, as she has no money to get on the train back. In the middle of the chaos, a man, dressed in train driver pilot uniform, approaches her and asks if she's alright. He's an authority, apparently, so she sees him as safe and explains everything. He says his train is exactly towards where she wants to go, and says she can come aboard the cabin and ride all the way there as his co-pilot. She's very excited, and boards the train without a ticket, and sits as his co-pilot, as he promised. Halfway through the journey, she realizes it's taking way longer than the usual trip takes, and he gives excuses that it's a different route, etc. She steps away to go to the bathroom, and he doesn't want to let her go, and that's when she starts to panic. She manages to convince him, and after about two cabins, she asks someone where the train is heading, and they say a completely different town as to where she should be going. She doesn't say how, but she was crying and wandering the cabins, until she miraculously runs into one of her uncles, who listens to the story, and they get down on the next stop. He puts her on the right train, and she makes it back safely to the city where she lives, not her grandparents. So apparently none of her family made it a priority to find out who this guy was. Though I suppose it'd be easy since he worked for the train company and worked that route. Her uncle looked for the man a few times, but not with any determination. She had nightmares for years, and her parents stopped letting the little kids ride the train by themselves, and that's it. For much of her youth, she was petrified she'd run into him. So yeah, that's a let's not meet of my grandma, who's now 76. This happened when I was around 17 years old, and is still happening now. At 17, I felt lost in the world, and stuck in a job I disliked with work colleagues that didn't like me. This had to do with my accent, as I was quite well-spoken, so they thought I was a rich kid. It all started on a Friday after work. The factory I worked in had a half day on Fridays, so I would just spend the rest of the day wandering around the city I lived in. It had been a tough day of relentless mocking, and I was reaching my breaking point. 
I went around the city looking for a new job. I visited the police recruitment center, the army, navy and air force centers, and even the international red cross. I just wanted to get away from it all. After a few hours, I had a bag full of career pamphlets and still no idea what to do with my life. I turned a corner and immediately saw a sign sitting in front of me. I can remember it so vividly now. It said, free personality test. Are you curious about yourself? Come in. I then looked up at the building and in a big fancy sign outside it said, the Church of Scientology. Now before I continue, yes, I already knew about Scientology. However, I had a morbid curiosity about it. I had heard all the horror stories and goings on inside the church, but Tom Cruise was my favorite actor and he seemed to have his life sorted out pretty good. My famous last words right there. So I went inside. I was immediately greeted by a very nice lady. She asked me how I was doing and what she could do for me today. I asked if I could speak to somebody about the church and the personality test. She smiled and said, I would be happy to. Please take a seat and I will get you someone to speak to. After a minute, I was introduced to an older man named Alan, and he was the head of my city Scientology center. Alan took me to a small room to talk privately. When we entered, I immediately noticed the large picture of L. Ron Hubbard on the wall. We sat down and genuinely had a nice chat. I told him about how I was unhappy about where my life was going. I told him about how I wanted to leave, plus all the trouble I was having at work. He seemed genuinely concerned for me, and I felt like he wanted to help. After a while of talking, I agreed to do the personality test. He gave me the test and left the room, saying to give the test to the receptionist after I had finished. Two hours later, I finished. Not joking, that's really how long it took. It was around 500 questions about anything and everything. I handed it in to the receptionist, and she told me it would take some time to process. In the meantime, Alan had told her to take me to the private cinema and show me a film. I thought it was just going to be some old room in the back with a TV on the wall, but no. They did indeed have a private cinema. It could seat around 50 people and had a large screen in the front. It did feel a bit weird just being by myself in a cinema owned by Scientology, but I bet that hasn't happened to many people. Or maybe it has? Anyway, I sat down and they played me the film. It was about 30 minutes long and consisted of a narrator explaining those strange feelings you sometimes get with some mediocre acting following along. I remember a section about how much you doubt yourself, knowing you have locked a door but going back to check multiple times. At one point the film showed how a past event that happened to your mother while she was pregnant with you could affect your life in a negative way. Example, your mother was sick on a flight, so you are scared of flying. I also vaguely remember something about rotten eggs and how much an event involving them can hurt you. I know it sounds absurd but in some ways the film really made sense to me. When the film was done, I was taken to Alan's office and he told me my results. He told me I was extremely depressed, one of the most unmotivated people he had ever met, lacking cognitive thinking, and I was a waste of talent. Now this made me very upset, but Alan said he could help me. He could give me about four books and a DVD. He told me to read the books and watch the film before my course. I asked, what course? And Alan told me he had signed me up to do a course at the center. He convinced me that if I didn't do this course, that my life would soon spiral out of control. He made me hand over quite a lot of money for the course and said I would receive an email about the course, which was in a month's time. I left the center ran home, and immediately started reading the books I was given. This all happened over the weekend. I had basically locked myself in my room and did nothing but read and reread those books and watch the DVD over and over again. Over the next week, I began taking notes about myself and my family. 
I emailed Alan with questions and concerns. I started resenting my mother for my life. I began to think that she was the problem, and that everything bad that happened to me was the result of her. I started to treat her badly, swearing at her, and did the best I could to ignore her. When I emailed Alan about my mother, he told me that if she was the catalyst for my problems, then maybe I should consider disconnecting from her. And I took that BS seriously. I made plans to totally leave her out of my life. A week before my course, I developed some kind of God complex towards everyone around me. What I read in those books told me what I could become. I saw everyone in my family as below me. I really became a truly spiteful person. Just days before my course, I was confronted by my mother and father. They said they were concerned about me and they searched my room. My dad took out all of my Scientology books and the DVD. I was outraged. I screamed and cursed at my parents. I said horrible, wicked things to them. I told them how I was going to leave them and how I never wanted to see them again. Hours of arguing back and forth, tears and crying. However, in the end, they did convince me that the church was a bad place. They said, if I was so miserable at work, I should have told them. And that is true. To this day, I can't believe I didn't say anything to them. Instead, I went to Scientology. That night, after the arguing had stopped, they sat me down and comforted me. I really couldn't believe it. After the way I had treated them for the past three weeks, they still cared for me. The next day I emailed Alan and told him I would not be coming back to the church. He quickly got back to me asking why, asking if it was my family and if I was being forced to not go. However, I ignored him. The emails I received in the next few weeks were mad. He told me stuff like, I should leave my family now and I could stay at the church. He tried to convince me that it was all because of my mother. He even emailed me to say something along the lines of, he won't be surprised if he read in the papers that I was found dead by suicide. I'm very sure he crossed the line there, but I just kept ignoring him. The strangest email I got was in all binary code. 00110101 this and 10001010110 that. I used a binary code translator, but it all came back as mixed up letters and numbers. None of it made sense. I eventually blocked him. However, it still hasn't stopped. About two or three times a year, I will get an email from the church. It's either asking how I am or asking about my family. When I get back to them, I immediately block the email address. But they just keep coming. It's always someone new saying they heard about my case, and they were worried about me. The whole reason I'm writing this is because I just got one the other day and I thought it would make a good warning. Please, I beg of you, do not go to the Church of Scientology Center. If they can make me into a spiteful degenerate in just a few hours, then what can they do with a person in a few months or a year? If anyone has any idea how to block an entire region from my email, then please let me know. And if you're lost in life, sad or upset, then please talk to your family, friends, or a doctor. When you are down, don't let others make you into a monster. Take it from me. After this event, I got help, and I'm a happy, confident person now. Thank you so much for reading, and have a great day. Oh, and Alan... If you are reading this, you made me into a monster, so for your sake, let's not meet again. This is technically my mother's story, although I am also in it. When I was four months old in 1994, my mom and dad had been having money issues, and as a result, he would often work late. One late Wednesday night around 9 p.m., there was a knock at the door, and my mom put me down in the living room and went to see if it was Dad, having forgotten his keys. 
She opened the door without looking properly, and a man was standing on the doorstep. He smiled at her and asked if he could use our phone as his car had broken down. Flustered, she said yes, and walked backwards a little to let him get to the telephone that lived on the hall table. However, he didn't stop at the table and kept walking up the hall towards her. She asked him what he wanted, pointed at the phone saying was right there, and said her husband was getting out of the shower. This is where it starts to get really creepy. He stopped walking, cocked his head to one side, said he didn't hear the shower running, and then gave her a really big smile. He added that he thought it was just her home right now, wasn't it? Mom said at this point, all she could think about was trying to make it to me, maybe dropping me out a window, trying to get us into the bathroom that had a lock, praying to any god or gods that were listening that dad would pull up in the driveway. Anything. And then she heard a growl. Mom had been out getting the washing in from the outside laundry before she'd gone in to check on me in the living room and had left the back door open a crack. Our Doberman pride had gotten into the house and had walked out of the kitchen into the hallway between Mom and this man. She started growling and showing all her teeth, and Mom told him to get out now before she sent the dog on him. Apparently he freaked out and backed out of the house before taking off down the street. Dad got home about 20 minutes later. Felt like eternity, according to Mom. The man was never caught, and we never saw him again, and I really hope I never do, even though I wouldn't know him if I saw him. Pry lived till she was 13 and was the most spoiled dog ever. I don't know what would have happened to Mum or me without her. This story takes place when I was 17, in a small border town that I grew up in. I lived in a house on a steep hill, and I took the bus every morning and after school to come home. Classes started very early, and no other students lived on my small street. It must have been during the winter because it was very cold every morning, which isn't a usual thing where I lived. I remember being afraid every morning because it was very dark outside, and I only had the light of the moon to guide me. And back then, cell phones didn't have flashlights that you could use to guide your way in the dark. There were only three other houses on my small street, and they were all on a big hill with paved driveways, coming down and meeting a gravelly road. The houses were arranged around a gravel cul-de-sac, which many people used to turn around if they went down the wrong road. I live in a desert area, so there were leafless mesquite trees and cactus around too, where it was very reminiscent of a forest or dense flora area. It was so quiet that all you could hear were the bats fluttering around the one streetlight that decided to work on the off day, but usually it was just pitch black. Along with the yapping of coyotes and crickets chirping, other than that, all I could hear was the crunching of the gravel beneath my feet. The first time I saw the man in a van, I wasn't that surprised. A lot of the time we would get these white vans passing us through because they delivered the papers to the surrounding houses. I then started to realize that this van would stop right next to me when I was standing alone waiting for the bus to arrive. There was a stop sign there, but there was no reason for the person in the van to be stopped there for 10 minutes until the bus picked me up. He must have started to get brave after that, because he would roll his window down and ask me if I was cold. I'd say yes, and ignore his presence and pretend like nothing happened. I just figured he was trying to be nice to me. He was an older Hispanic man in his 70s. Again, the next day he pulls up even closer to me. Are you cold? You look beautiful today. But you look so cold. This time I just ignored him and waited for the bus to pull up and I got in. I would watch his van pull away after my bus left. He kept doing this for two weeks until one day he looked at me through his window and said, I could use a pretty girl like you. It's cold outside. You must be so cold. Come inside my van and I'll keep you warm until your bus gets here. 
I looked at him in horror, and luckily the bus pulled up a few seconds later, and I decided I needed to tell someone about him. My dad is in law enforcement, and I told my dad what had been happening. He asked me what he looked like and when the van would pull up. He said I should have told him sooner, but he's glad I told him when I did. He called the police, and I told the police what had been happening. They said they had similar reports in the area and that they would catch him. The next day, the police hid behind me where the cul-de-sac is, and I stood in my usual spot where I stood before the bus. I remember that day the streetlight was finally working, and I could see the man's face in the van. He didn't realize the officer was there until he made a full turn around the cul-de-sac and started towards me. The police turned their lights on and pulled him over. I could hear him yelling as the bus pulled in and I left for school. I could see the police lights glaring on the bus windows. The next day my dad sat me down and told me he had to talk to me. Apparently the man had many suspicious things in the van. He had duct tape, plastic bags, zip ties, condoms, lube, black trash bags, a machete, and some other strange things. He claimed to be a newspaper man, and he would distribute the newspapers to my neighbors. Yet the police never found one newspaper in his van when they searched it. My dad ran a background check on him, and he had a CD past. I'm not sure whatever happened to the man legally, but he never showed his face again on that street. But whenever I stood there at the end of the street, all I could think about is if he had gotten the courage to step out of his van, that I would have no way to defend myself, and no one would have heard from me again. To the man in the white van, I hope no pretty cold teenager girl ever meets you again. Thank you for making it this far. I hope you enjoyed the video. I just wanted to quickly let you know about a couple things I have going on. I have an Instagram where I post more personal things about who I am. It isn't just all creepy stuff. You can find me at Stories After Midnight. I also have a Twitter where I mainly retweet and like things I find interesting. The handle for that is in the description, but it is S underscore A underscore Midnight. I should really find another one because that's hard to say. If you really like what I'm doing, consider joining the Midnighters. That's my growing community where we hang out and have fun and talk about cats. You can find a link to our Discord in the description below. We'd love to see you there. Other than that, it'd make me happier than a cat on a table full of antique glassware if you'd like the video and consider sticking around for more. We'll see you in the next one.